thank you very much for inviting me to present to you this morning on evidence-based HR management. I do have quite a lot of slides, so if you've got any questions, you can ask me during or we can wait to the end. Uh, and also, of course, I make my slides available at the end, and if you want any resources and to read more about evidence-based HR, I can also make that available as well via memory. So don't worry if it feels a bit fast, I will give you a chance to ask questions during and at the end, and also all the materials will be available afterwards. So, uh, first then, let's think about, my screen is locked, one second, share another one. Sorry, I'm just gonna share another screen, one second. That's okay. Okay, that maybe should work. Okay, good. Okay, so yes, so some of these things will be available uh, afterwards as well. So I want to briefly talk about the point of evidence-based practice in general, where it came from, talk a little bit about what it is and some of the barriers to it, and also just towards the end, give you a chance to reflect a bit on how evidence-based you think you are, in your practice or your team is and how you can start to apply this to your work so just uh, just a few moments reflection what do you think just to think about this yourself what do you think evidence-based practice in hr is uh, what do you think it means what does it mean to you and just think for you know just for 20 seconds or so about your definition or understanding what does evidence-based practice in hr what does it mean to you Okay, thank you for doing that. Uh, and as we go through the presentation, uh, perhaps you can reflect back on what you think evidence-based HR and evidence-based practice might be. So what is the point of evidence-based practice? Now, this seems a bit obvious, but I don't think it is necessarily. It's essentially based on these assumptions that HR and in fact all professionals should firstly do stuff that addresses important business or organizational problems, not trivial things, and also do stuff that's more likely to work or stuff that doesn't work or, or has little effect or does harm. If you agree, and I think most professionals do in my professional work, I certainly agree with that. The question is, how are we going to do that? And of course, the answer to that question is evidence-based practice or something like it. Evidence-based practice has been adopted in many different professional fields to do those two things, to address what's important and to do what's more likely to work. Where does the idea come from? Well, it actually came from that idea of trying to use the best available evidence. So the elevator pitch for this is that decisions about important problems and opportunities or the most likely solutions should be based on the best available evidence. So for us in HR, evidence means any relevant in information or data. And typically they are scientific findings, the kinds of things you might find published by universities or academics, but that's only one source. Organizational data is another source your own expertise and experience as a practitioner, that's another source, but also stakeholders. And for us in HR, that's typically employees, senior managers, maybe the board in the public sector, a stakeholder might be the government. So there's other kinds of stakeholders as well. But the key point is there's multiple sources of evidence. Now, this is a very important point, which is we always use evidence, but that's not the same as an evidence-based approach. Everybody uses evidence, that's fine, but it's not the same as an evidence-based approach. Evidence-based practice is a thing. It, it's been around for probably at least 30 years. It started off in medicine and has gone through these different fields. These are roughly the dates at which these different areas of practice decided to adopt the idea of evidence-based practice. So medicine, education, social care, nursing, criminal justice, management, etc. So it's been around for quite a while and has run through a few professions. These are just some examples. This is the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. Uh, obviously very relevant at the moment with the current uh, pandemic, but medicine, policing, same kind of issue, policy making even, government should make policy based on evidence, conservation, education, agriculture, aged care, social work, etc. Mentoring, 
and most recently the Centre for Evidence-Based Management, which we set up about 10 years ago, to try and do for the profession of management and HR what those other centres have done for their professions. Uh, this is a book that came out recently from the Centre about evidence-based management, which you may be interested in. In the UK, you may have heard of the CIPD, the Chartered Institute of Personal and Development, that's the professional body for HR professionals in the UK. Uh, it's sort of started to adopt evidence-based practice. So in 2016, it published a couple of articles. These are all available online on the CIPD website about searching for evidence, trying to publish scientific evidence to help practitioners. This is its profession map. So these are the things which it felt HR professionals should be able to do. This goes back to 2013. And if you look at it, there's not much there about evidence-based practice. But if you look at the 2018 profession map, you can see that one of the three core, if you like, principles is principles-led, evidence-based, outcomes-driven. So at least in the UK, CIPD is an HR professional body that started to adopt evidence-based HR. So what is it? This definition is not my definition, it's not the Centre for Evidence-Based Management definition, but it's a definition of evidence-based practice that's used quite widely across a number of fields. So it's a conscientious, which means you try, explicit, which means you write down, you share that information, and judicious, judging the quality of the best available evidence from multiple sources, and it's all about increasing the likelihood of a favourable outcome. So it's about a process. It is not about certainties or answers, it's about probabilities and likelihoods. And in a sense, from the evidence-based practice perspective, the best thing you can say is it's really about reducing uncertainty. You could say, given our context, it is more likely if we do X rather than Y, it will lead to the outcome we want, or compared to, say, doing something else or doing nothing. So it's about reducing uncertainty rather than having a definite answer. This is an infographic, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail, which was produced by the CIPD in the Centre for Evidence-Based Management. So you use this first as the idea to identify a problem or opportunity, and if, and only if, you identify one fairly clearly, you then use it to identify a possible solution or intervention. And as I'll come back to later, I think HR, like many professions, tends to not spend enough time on diagnosis. Is there a problem? Is there an opportunity? It tends to do stuff and intervene and be very active rather than thinking, well, what might the problem be? So these are the four sources of evidence already mentioned. Uh, scientific, organisational, stakeholders and practitioner. That's the definition I just mentioned. And the idea is you go through a, set, a sort of process, a structured process to help you ask better questions. The first you ask a question, you then acquire the evidence you need. You critically appraise, which means judging the quality of it. You pull it together. You apply it and then you assess. And again, it's all about increasing the likelihood of a favourable outcome. So one thing people often say is, well, we're already evidence based. So in HR, yes, we're already evidence based. We use data all the time. Of course, we're evidence based. Yes, as I said before, everybody uses data. That's not the issue. Everybody uses evidence. It's, it's a specific way of thinking about it. And I think there are three main differences between evidence-based practice and what we all already do. The first one is the approach to the use of evidence. How do we approach using evidence? And is this idea going to conscientious, explicit, judicious? Do we really try to get hold of good evidence? Do we really, are we really explicit about it? Do we share it? Do we discuss it? Do we capture those data and evidence in some way? And judicious, do we really think, can I trust this information? Or do we just use it? So the approach, I think, is a difference. Most of us don't take that approach. The second main difference is multiple sources. So we do this for two reasons. One is to triangulate and cross-check. So if the scientific evidence is saying one thing, does our professional expertise say the same thing or different things? Similarly, do our organisational data look different or the same to what our experience is? We're comparing. We're trying to see what the picture is. That's one reason for doing multiple sources. The other reason is to contextualise. So, for example, even if we have some apparently very good high quality scientific evidence it doesn't mean it's relevant to our context or our organization so we also need organizational data for example to help us better use scientific evidence so it's both to contextualize the evidence but also to cross-check in terms of triangulation that's the second difference multiple sources the third difference i think is taking a structured or stepped approach 
we get try and get evidence for the possible problems or opportunities first and only then do we start thinking about evidence for solutions why do we take a structured or stepped approach because we're easily pushed off track it's, it's quite difficult to do this not because it's technically complicated but because other things grab our attention so st sticking to a structure can be useful and there's many individual and organizational obstacles so even if you start off trying to be trying to do an evidence-based practice approach it may be you know you things get in the way so that's why it's important to take the structured approach so there are differences between i think what we normally do in terms of using evidence and evidence-based practice and i think those differences are very important so i'm going to give you an example now and i'm going to go through it quite quickly but it's just to give you a feel for if you were in an hr team what you might do around a specific kind of problem or, or issue in the organization just to give an example of the kinds of questions you'd start to ask so employee engagement is an example i've chosen because it's quite popular or at least has been quite popular so employee engagement is is seen as a big deal i think it's going slightly out of fashion now in some context but it has, certainly has been seen a big deal in the last i would say 10 15 20 years so there are many books published about employee engagement this is one this is another there are dozens and dozens of books around engagement which is a very popular idea even employee engagement for dummies which shows i think how popular this idea has become employee engagement for everyone not just for dummies employee engagement 2.0 loyalty 3.0 etc the employee engagement mindset uh, magic of engagement etc etc lessons from the mouse house how Disney have tried to do employee engagement, what you can learn from it, the truth about engagement, uh, contented cows still will give better milk. Again, there, there's just dozens of books here. The Rebel Playbook for Engagement, and of course, Rockstar Ideas for Employee Engagement. So it's been around for a long time. Uh, also, in your context, uh, in Zimbabwe, there's examples of this. This is a one example marketing lab talking about people engaging with uh, their employer. This is another example from the Herald. Again, they're, they're kind of several years old now, employee engagement works wonders, and etc. Dollars and cents of employee engagement. Again, one from the Your Professional Bodies uh, magazine. Also from the Financial Gazette. Again, headlines here showing that employee engagement in your context, my context, many contexts, is seen by HR as a very important thing to focus on. So having established that, what kind of a problem or opportunity might HR professionals see when it comes to employee engagement? So I think a typical problem I've come across or perceived is that uh, employees feel, sorry, uh, HR people or maybe the managers feel that they have low engagement. That employee engagement is not high enough. They're measuring it, it isn't high enough, and they want to try and increase it. And that's a very classic problem. How would you approach this problem or solution from an evidence-based practice approach, what kinds of questions would you ask? So again, they're the four sources of evidence. I'm gonna go through each quite quickly, just giving you some examples of some of the questions you would ask. So firstly, and these are in no particular order, you would look at your own professional expertise and the expertise of your team. And then you'd focus on identifying the problem. Have we seen these EE employee engagement problems before? based on our experience as a leveling of engagement to problem. What do we think are the causes and consequences of that? What do we think as a group of professionals about this? And then we might think about the solution. Have we seen interventions before? What do we think works? What do we believe about engagement interventions? And based on our experience, is it worth intervening? So your engagement score might be low. You could maybe increase employee engagement, but is it worth it? Is the effect of it actually worth the investment you need to increase it? Now, a question we need to always ask about any source of evidence is how relevant, applicable, and trustworthy is our expertise? And it may be extremely relevant, it may not be very relevant, and it may not be very trustworthy. So any source of evidence can be very useful and valid and helpful, or it can be very unhelpful, and in a sense, and in essence, it can be a source of bias. So we need to always say, is my experience in this case applicable, trustworthy, and relevant? That's the first element. The second one is organizational data. So if you look at maybe your engagement scores, what is the engagement level? Are your measures of engagement actually good? Are they trustworthy? Do data show how and if low engagement is causing problems? So for example, can you see associations or causal effects between drops in engagement? And for example, increases absenteeism. Can you see links between 
increases in engagement, for example, and increases in performance. Can you see that engagement or low engagement is a problem in the organization? And if you can, again, identify a solution by looking at your organizational data. What's going on? What's happening with our data? What do we think is happening in the organization? And again, how relevant, applicable, and trustworthy are our organizational data? Third area is scientific literature. If you go and look at scientific journals, what does a review of the evidence, for example, say, say are there problems with low engagement? Are there lots of really good studies? Are there one or two studies? What does the evidence say about you know, what seems to be the issues with engagement? And if there is an issue, again, what does the scientific evidence say about the solutions? And again, how relevant, applicable, and trustworthy are the scientific findings? And it's important to state, people often assume that scientific findings are necessarily the most valid and reliable findings. Well, you can't assume that. They may be, they may not. It depends on your question. It depends on what the evidence shows and what kind of evidence there is. So you can't assume that scientific literature is necessarily the most relevant, applicable, trustworthy. It may be, it may not be. Finally, the fourth element, stakeholder values and concerns. So if you talk to employees, do they see a problem with low engagement? If you talk to your customers, clients, managers, do they, what do they think? Is, and is there a problem for them with low engagement? And if there is, simply what do they think about the solutions? And again, how relevant, applicable and trustworthy is the evidence? Now, that's a lot of questions. I appreciate that's a lot of questions. And often people get very concerned if I ask people, well, how long do you think this would take? They say, oh, it would take a year. It would take six months. And if I say, is it doable? They go, well, it is doable, but it would really take a long, long time. Is it worth it? Maybe, but maybe not. Now, the good news is you can do this very quickly. Bear in mind, this is a process. You may go through these questions and actually not have many answers. These questions, these questions, these questions. But that's okay, because the point is you're still going through the process and you'll make a decision based on the best available evidence you have. And you're still more likely to make a better decision than if you don't go through that process. That's the first thing. Secondly, you'll be very aware of why you're making that decision. What do you know? Can you trust it? What don't you know? You can still make a decision, but you're much more aware of what that decision is based on. So in that sense, from an organizational professional learning perspective, it's still very important. So although it looks like a long, complicated process, which it can be, it doesn't have to be. It depends on how much time, the resources you have to do it. But the key point is, if you go through the process, you're still more likely to get the outcome you want than if you don't go through that process. So here's a fundamental challenge, and I think people don't object to the idea of making better informed decisions. People don't generally disagree with evidence-based practice, but uh, the, they, it isn't happening very much, even though people also do have some of the skills, indeed a lot of the skills they need to do it. So the striking thing to me is this idea feels like common sense, it feels obvious. And I think lots of things that common sense and obvious turn out to not be so common uh, and don't make so much sense as they appear at first. So what happens if we dig a bit deeply into this and ask the question, why isn't this happening so much? One way I like to think about this is to think of barriers. So if people try and do this, if you're an HR manager or a team, and you try and do this, you'll come across barriers. What are those barriers? Because I think unless we understand some of these barriers, it makes it very difficult to do evidence-based practice. There's lots and lots of barriers. I'm not going to talk about all of those. I'm going to just talk about the first four. There's many things that get in the way. So the first barrier is misconceptions. So this is things people think evidence-based practice is, but it isn't. They get in the way of people doing it. The first thing people seem to mean, there is these general misconceptions. People think practitioners can't use their expertise, but of course you have to use your expertise. People think evidence is about the truth and proof. Well, it isn't. It's about just making a better informed decision. We shouldn't be looking for the truth. We should be making a better informed decision. People also feel it's about making a perfect decision. No, it's about making a better decision. People also feel sometimes that gathering the evidence will give you the answer. But of course it doesn't. The more information and evidence we get about something, the more we learn and the more we realize there isn't an answer. Uh, maybe our question wasn't too good either. So we learn, but there isn't a single answer. And people already think they're doing it. That's another barrier. People think, oh, I'm already doing this. And it's possible you are, but I think it's unlikely. Bear in mind these three differences I already discussed. The approach, multiple sources, a structure and steps approach. Sure, people are doing a little bit of it, 
but they're not taking this approach uh, in terms of the whole process. I think there's also common misconception or myth in HR that using widely used or approved tools or benchmarking is the same as doing evidence-based practice. So for example, assessment centers or employee engagement surveys or 360 degree feedback, because these things seem to be best practice, the assumption is they are evidence-based. Well, they're not. Uh, we need to ask what's the evidence that there's a real problem that this practice can fix? Is the practice generally effective? What's the evidence? And even if there is some evidence, will that practice work here? Just because it works somewhere else doesn't mean it's gonna work here. And will it do it better than something else? So even if it works, even in my work here, is it the best thing to do in your circumstance? And also crucially, do the benefits outweigh the costs? So think just the idea of best practice can be quite dangerous. Just copying what other people do can be, can be real, a real problem, I think. I think another misconception is that as we move into, HR's moved into, I guess, the last decade or longer into the idea of doing data analytics, people somehow feel that using data and data analytics is the same as evidence-based practice. It definitely isn't. It's part of it, but it's only part of it. So imagine going to your doctor because you're ill and she says she's going to diagnose and treat you by only looking at your blood tests, for example, MRI scans, CAT scans, and all the diagnostics she could do to you. And she was going to completely ignore all the evidence from medical science, her professional expertise as a doctor, and she wasn't even going to talk to you. She wasn't going to ask you anything. If you met that doctor, you think, well, that, she is not a very good doctor because actually all those other sources of evidence are important. Yet that's exactly what we do if we only focus on data analytics, data from organization. We're ignoring at least three other very important sources of information. So going back to the diagram, you can see that if you only do data analytics, you're, you're essentially ignoring three other very important sources of evidence. And just as with a doctor, those other sources of evidence are incredibly important. So the misconception is one barrier. The second barrier is cognitive biases. And some of you will be very familiar with some of this stuff, I'm sure. But the idea is roughly we have system one and system two thinking. So system one is what we use most of the time to do most things. It's fast, emotional, low efforts. We use a lot of cognitive shortcuts or heuristics. When we think something's really cool or wow or horrible, that tends to be system one, very, very quick, very non-conscious, just processing of information. System two is slow, it requires more effort, and it involves more critical reasoning about what's going on, the information, what it means, what it's telling us, and so on. And the idea is we are kind of hardwired to make these fast system one decisions because they are great for most everyday things we do as human beings, it's, they're fine. But the problem is system one is not good, in fact it's terrible for making larger, more complicated decisions where we need to slow down we need to think, we need to make more effort to understand the way we're thinking, why we're thinking, what we're thinking. So these are some visual, uh, I guess, cognitive biases. You're probably, again, you're probably very familiar with them. If you look at this, it appears as though these lines are actually wonky, but of course they're not. They're parallel. If you look down the edge of the slide, or if you had a ruler, you could see that actually these lines are parallel, but it looks like they're not. And in a way, I think visual illusions like this give us some important clues about how to be an evidence-based practitioner. We shouldn't believe what we see. If it looks wonky, okay, it looks wonky, but we need to check it. If we get a ruler, if we look down the side, that's a good example of using another source of evidence. The evidence of our eyes is that they're wonky. Okay, fine, let's get some more evidence. And if we do get other evidence by looking down the side of the slide, by measuring it, doing something else, we'll realize these other sources of evidence are telling us something else. These lines are not wonky, they're actually completely parallel. This is another example, and of course all these elephants are actually the same size. Here's another example. Now these are what I call kind of HR visual illusions. And if you worked in HR for any time, you've probably seen these things a lot. So the, the idea is on the left-hand side, we see engagement drivers, Things like leadership, these lead to these outcomes, which in turn lead to business outcomes like satisfaction, net promoter score, and so on. When we see these, we should treat them as potential illusions and ask, are they real? My eyes are telling me engagement leads to these outcomes, leads to business outcomes, but is that real? Is it not real? Is it true? Is it not true? Let me get some more evidence. This looks very impressive, but is it? 
This is another example. And again, the blue lines, the horizontal lines, again, are actually parallel, but they look like they're not parallel. Here's another example that, that probably is an illusion. Those of you, some of you may recognize this as Cotter's model of change, model of organizational change. So you create urgency and you go through these steps, and this is how you do change. Again, is this an illusion or is it something we should take seriously? And to, do, to know that, we need to get other sources of evidence and information because visually, it looks very appealing. It, look, it kind of makes sense. This is another one. And if you look around the screen, you will see a different, well, you'll see probably a maximum of four black dots appearing. But the black dots seem to appear where you look on the screen. Now, again, you might think, well, this, this is a kind of animated slide. It isn't. It's just an optical illusion caused by this but again you need to find out are these dots really appearing and disappearing actually on the screen or is it just something i'm seeing again is it an illusion and here's another one the hr talent management framework and again i say is this is this an illusion an hr illusion or is it something we should take seriously again you need more sources of evidence in that triangle if you think about what that said uh, most of you probably saw it as it's saying i'll show you again most of you probably thought it said Paris in the spring, but it doesn't say Paris in the spring. It says Paris in the, the spring. And this is an interesting thing about system one, the very thing that allows us to read quickly and effortlessly and unconsciously just read stuff is the same system that means we miss the fact that this has two the in it. So we need to slow down, read differently and think more carefully. Here's a classic one. Uh, a bat and a ball cost one pound and ten pence, or it could be one dollar and ten cents. The bat cost a pound more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Okay, so I'll give you a kind of 20 seconds to think about that. So if you're trying to think that through, people give a range of answers, but most people give the answer 10, 10 pence or 10 cents. That's the answer I first gave when I heard it, though that's wrong. Because if you add, if it does cost 10 pence, so bat and ball costs one pound and 10 pence, and the bat costs a pound more than the ball, the bat will cost one pound 10 if the ball costs 10, which in total may one pound 20 pence. So it can't be 10. The reason we say 10 is because <coughs> Excuse me, that's our system one again, where you see bat and ball, one pound, ten pence, the bat cost a pound or the ball. What wants to pop out is ten. But I actually say the correct answer is five pence. Now, people who get this, they get it in two ways. One is by checking it, as I did. And if you check it, you realize it's not right. Another way people do it is those people who think in terms of arithmetic or they think in terms of equations and algebra. <coughs> Excuse me, they tend to get that very quickly because they know this is a problem to be solved using an equation. There's also, of course, lots of other uh, biases, such as confirmation bias, hindsight bias, loss aversion. We are subject to very, very many cognitive biases, things that affect the way we see and process information. And I think the most important bias is what I've described here as a metacognitive bias, the bias or belief that we don't have any biases. So biases are normal. Biases don't have an off switch. So one thing that gets in the way of evidence-based practice is these biases and evidence-based practice, it can't switch them off, but it can help us think about them and control them to some extent. The third example is strong among beliefs. I'm just going to give you one or two examples. I'm afraid these are from a US, UK context. I apologize, they're not relevant to your context so much, but uh, Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Stephen Hawking said the same thing in a different way. The greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. In other words, ignorance is fine, but false beliefs are a problem. If we think we know something and we're wrong, that's a real problem. If we don't know something, then we're more likely to ask questions and try to find out. So I'll just give you uh, a couple of examples here. It's average job tenure in the UK and the US. So if you ask people this in the UK, US, Canada, other contexts where they may be more familiar with the UK, job market, almost everyone says job tenure 
how long people stay in the job. They believe it's gone down. If you look at the British press, uh, the, the US press, there's lots of stories about job tenures going down and down, people staying in jobs less time. But if you look at national level data, that doesn't seem to be the case. This is from the UK, uh, comparing 1997 with 2017, so 20 years. And you can see the average job tenure has, in, if anything, slightly gone up over that 20 year period. But most people believe it's gone down. Similarly in the US, and also the percentage of workforce and permanent employment. This is just UK data. If you ask people in the UK, HR people, what do you think has happened in terms of the percentage of workforce in permanent jobs? Almost everyone says it's gone down. There are fewer people now in permanent jobs than there were 20 years ago. But again, look at national level statistics, and it's the second column that's most important here. You can see the percentage of permanent employees hasn't really changed in 20 years. So those people have very strong beliefs sometimes about what's going on that may not be right. If people believe these things, it may very much affect the way we as HR practitioners make decisions around, for example, recruitment or retention or whatever it happens to be, generation X, generation Y, treating people differently on the basis of generations. So strong and wrong belief is also a barrier. The final barrier I want to talk about before I conclude is management fads and fashions. Now, we all like certain ideas. Uh, some of those ideas turn out to be quite reasonable and quite valid. Some of these ideas just turn out to be things that are fashionable. Everybody got jumped on the bandwagon and over time we can see they probably weren't of very much value. And these are just some examples of ideas that might fit into that category. I think many of them do, maybe not all of them, but many of them do. So the idea of re-engineering, this is going back to, uh, based on business process re-engineering, re going back to maybe the 80s. Excellence, some of you may be familiar with that book. Total quality, talent, agile, lean, uh, employee engagement again, uh, and also blockchain. Blockchain is a good example, I think, of something that's become very fashionable. Uh, but you can really ask questions about how valuable it is. So some people call it a pixie dust fad. Uh, the Financial Times not that long ago said blockchain officially confirmed a slow and more, expense, uh, and more expensive and disillusionment descends on financial services. So this blockchain is a good example of one of those ideas that lots of people, including people in HR, really grabbed onto as this new, exciting thing. People have tried to look at how business fads have changed over time, and these are just some examples of where uh, Richard Pascal has tried to say, look, these things come into fashion, like for example, management by objectives, and then they kind of die out again, or just in time or empowerment. Really trying to make the point that we must be very careful when these new ideas come along to ask questions about really, are they really adding value? Or are they just something everyone is doing and everyone's very excited about? Because fads get in the way of clear and critical thinking. They encourage something called solutioneering, where we identify a problem by the solution. We need to do emotional intelligence training. Well, do you? Why? What's the problem? We must increase engagement scores. We need to do performance appraisals. They're not problems. They are solutions looking for a problem. But of course, some of these fads may be affected, but even if you know, they work a bit, they're not panaceas. Their effect may not be large. They may be no more effective than what you're doing already. They can be harmful. And one of the key things about fads is that they're over-applied. If you take lean, for example, lean and lean manufacturing principles may make a lot of sense and be very effective in some contexts. In other contexts, it may be disastrous. So you have to be very careful that we're not, these fads don't grab us and we deploy things that maybe we haven't thought about too much. So fads as well are something else that gets in the way of evidence-based HR. So just to pull things together a bit now, I mean, the first thing to think about is how evidence-based are you and your team? So we can think about these questions. So to what extent would you describe your approach and commitment as, for example, conscientious, explicit, and judicious? To what extent do you use multiple sources in a conscientious, explicit, and judicious way? Or do you maybe just only use one? To what extent do you take an explicit and structured approach to both identifying problems and potential solutions? Do you actually try and do that? Or do you just sit around and have a general conversation? Or do you take a more structured approach? So, one way to think about this is first to ask the question, how evidence-based are we already? To try and identify some gaps. How can you start to apply evidence-based practice to your and your team's work? 
Well, I think first you can check out the CIPD resources, and I mentioned SEPMA already, the Centre of Evidence Based Management. There's lots of resources there, articles, guidelines, checklists to help you start thinking about using evidence based practice in your HR work. But you can start applying this process to decisions you're making right now. You can look at literally look at that process, this kind of process, and think, can I use it for things that I'm doing now? Think about upcoming decisions. I think thirdly, you can conduct an evidence-based audit of your key HR practices. So for example, if you do talent management, or if you do an employee engagement survey, whatever it happens to be, can you look at that practice and go through this process and think, what is the problem or opportunity this practice is trying to help with? And what do we know about that? And also, what do we know about whether it is actually doing that? Fourth, we can think about the quantity and quality of evidence we already have now and how it can be improved. One major barrier, which I didn't talk about, to evidence-based practice is that it's very difficult to get hold of evidence sometimes. But if you don't make it easier, we'll never get better at using more different kinds of evidence. So getting better at accessing the evidence is also important. The fifth thing, what extra knowledge and skills do we need to become more evidence-based? What can we do now? What maybe can't we do now? What are the main personal and organizational barriers and how could they in principle be tackled? Remember that it's a collective thing, not an individual thing. It's the organization and the team, not the individual that needs to take responsibility for this. And finally, there's sometimes a danger of becoming the evidence police where people say, I know the answer, I've got the answer, I've got the evidence, you're wrong. It's not about that. It's about making a better informed decision. So that's something to be aware of. So here's some tips finally to get started. I think the first tip I'll say is just try it. Try to do it. You don't have to do it, you know, completely or thoroughly. You don't have to spend weeks on it. Just try it. You know, try it for one decision you're making or going to make soon. Just, just try doing it and see how it is. Always, always, always start with and spend more time getting evidence about the problem or opportunity. As I mentioned before, I think one of the main barriers to evidence-based practice is that people want to move on very quickly to implementing some solution or to doing something they feel is practical and useful without really having a good understanding of what the problem or opportunity might be. So spend more time with that bit rather than rolling things out, implementing stuff. But we have the tendency to look too quickly for solutions. And this, I think, is the solutioneering problem where people are looking for solutions uh, because they're there without thinking, well, what, what is the problem we actually have? Just something simple, a good tip for getting started is just ask the question, why a lot? Ask why, why are we doing this? What is it for? How does it work? Why this rather than that? Just ask those questions, not in a threatening way or an aggressive way, just because it will help you make a better decision. Be skeptical of things that look cool or cutting edge or leading edge. They may be useful, but the chances are they won't be. Remember that we're full of biases. Don't just believe what you see or hear. Try and find other sources of evidence and think critically about the quality of the information you're being given. Like with the example with visual illusions, something looks like a particular way. OK, can I get more evidence from other sources to think about how accurate my perception is? And remember, in the end, it's about making a better informed decision, not a perfect decision. So finally, just to conclude, why bother adopting an evidence based approach? Uh, so going right back to the beginning, I think an evidence-based practice approach or something like it is the only way we can do stuff that addresses important business or organizational problems and opportunities, not trivial stuff. So it's about doing what is important. And secondly, it's about doing stuff that is more likely to be effective and to work, not stuff that's unlikely to work or has little effect or do harm. So the entire point of evidence-based practice, as far as I can, I'm concerned, is doing those two things. What is important and what is more likely to work? That's all, and it's important, but it's all it's about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Brina, uh, uh, for that insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I'll give uh, participants an opportunity to ask questions. I've got a question sure. on, on the chat here. Uh, Morgan says, how do I use evidence-based approach when I'm, I'm new to an employer? You join a new employer, the HR manager. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good question. So typically, I think when people are joining a new uh, employer, I think it depends very much on the context. So what, what I have found is that some organizations, when you join them, it turns out they're quite in favor of evidence-based practice. They quite like it. 
You go to another organization, they just want you to do stuff. And if you try asking why too many times, you will not make yourself very popular. So I think one of the first things to do is to actually find out what do people there already know about evidence-based practice? Do they support it? Do senior management, do they make decisions in an evidence-based way or not? And if they do, that's great because you can just do what culturally they're already doing as an organization. But if they're not, and you want to do evidence-based practice, then you have to be very careful. I think you do it slowly, you do it carefully, you try and explain the principles of evidence-based practice to your colleagues in not a threatening way, but always focus back on saying to people, I work in HR and I want to do what's important for the business. And I want to do what's more likely to work, which is why I'm taking an evidence-based practice approach. Then I think it won't seem too threatening and it won't seem like too much of a clash with what they're already doing. But it is difficult if you're new and you're trying to do this. So you have to kind of suss out what the organization is like now, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one, of, one, of, Prof, one of the things that I see when, when a, a new HR manager joins an organization, the first thing that they do is they go and they develop HR policies uh, randomly. Yeah? Uh, yes, how effective yeah. are, are these policies? Uh, do we have research that shows uh, which ones should I prioritize on the basis of impact on the business? Yeah, I think, I think HR has a reputation uh, for being developing policies, being policy makers. And I, of course, think developing a, developing a policy or practice is a great idea if and only if you're pretty sure you know what the problem or issue is. So what I've seen a lot in HR is people say, we need a policy for this. So let's look at what other organizations are doing. Okay, mm -hmm. that looks like a good policy. Let's have this policy. In, in essence, I think that's a mistake unless you think it's HR's job just to develop lots of policies. If you think it's HR's job to do what's important and do what's more likely to work, then you need to spend a lot more time thinking, yeah, we could develop this policy, we could develop this practice, but let's actually find out first what the issue or problem is. Then we can try and find a policy or practice that's most appropriate to our circumstances. So I think it's fine to do this. Mm -hmm. I think it's very dangerous to do it if you're just copying policies and developing policies just so you look important or just so because you think you need something to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that can be an issue too. Yeah, there's another question from Doris in uh, Kenya. Doris says, I'm a big fan of you. Uh, the challenge is I come, across, uh, I come across in Kenya is access to scientific information relevant yes. to our region and also building credibility where we have not been known to be evidence-based and more fed followers. I think, yeah, interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, it is an interesting question. So I think, yes, getting hold of scientific evidence is very important. The, the, the bad news is that historically, academics like me have been terrible at doing this. <laughs> the good news is we're getting better. So there, if you go, for example, to Google Scholar, you'll find now lots of the things you might want to read are accessible. You can get hold of them. Uh, they're not always very easy to read unless you're a researcher yourself, but you can at least start to get hold of them and get hold, for example, of the views. That's the first thing. The second thing I would say is don't just look at Google Scholar. Also go to something like the Center for Evidence-Based Management. Because if you go there, you'll find lots of summaries of the scientific evidence and scientific literature and also the CIPB website. So it's very difficult to look through lots of individual scientific articles to try and make sense. It's much better if you've got a good high quality systematic review and again other part of the good news is they are now starting to be produced so by cipd the center for evidence-based management and some other sources as well so again sedma the center for evidence-based management is a good place to go to start both finding the evidence but also to find some guidance about how you can start to do it for yourself uh, so i think i think it, it's difficult but it's getting better Yes, Prof. Uh, on the quality of evidence, is, do we have a hierarchy of uh, the best evidence you find them in? Yeah. 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 There are, so there are hierarchies in terms of thinking about things like the way a study is designed. And that hi mm -hmm. similar hierarchy is also applied, by the way, for internal organizational data mm -hmm. and for data from experience and data from your stakeholders. So for any kind of evidence, first, you need to think about the question. So, for example, if your question is a qualitative question, the kind of the quality of evidence and the trustworthiness, the hierarchy will be different from if it's a quantitative question. Similarly, if your question is around the effectiveness of an intervention, the hierarchy may be different. So I would say 
there isn't one hierarchy there are many different hierarchies and you need to choose you need to judge the quality of the evidence by the question you're asking and not assume that for example a so-called randomized control trial is necessarily the highest quality of evidence it isn't it depends on your question but again, on the sense of evidence-based management, there's some useful guidance there about how you can start to think about the quality of evidence from scientific evidence, but also from other sources as well. And that's a very important part, part of this, that we all get a bit better at thinking about the quality and trustworthiness of the evidence we get hold of. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the issues, Prof, is that if you go into most of the management meetings, you find people give their own opinions yeah, uh, uh, as evidence, uh, and it's a so, challenge because they always want to win. How do you deal with such kind yeah. of? Mm. Sure. I mean, I would say an opinion uh, can be a form of evidence, and it is. But the key question always is, what is that opinion based on? So, mm-hmm. for example, some opinions may be based on great, high quality, highly relevant evidence and information. Other opinions may be not. So I would say one of the key things to do is not to dismiss someone's opinion, but to try and understand what that opinion is based on. And again, if people very much, if, it, if their opinion is not based on much, but they have very strong views about it. And the key thing is always to try and remind people uh, that what ideally we're trying to do is to focus on what's important and to, and to do things that are more likely to work. So whilst they may have a very strong view about it, which is great, the question is, what's that view based on? And we need to be clear about what it's based on in order to decide what is important or what is more likely to work. So, for example, people often have strong opinions about problems. Mm-hmm. They will say, uh, oh, in this organization, I don't know, performance is a real problem or motivation is a real problem or absence is a terrible problem. Mm-hmm. Fine, but what is that based on? So to try and get it away from them and their opinion towards being explicit about what that evidence is and that's difficult sometimes as i think you're implying memory that's difficult. yes yes but i think as long as you say let's have a shared view about what the evidence is then we can start to have opinions about it but let's open up and share what that information is yeah thank you i've got another question from james in nigeria he says as a new employee to an organization senior management staff find it difficult to adopt to this evidence-based approach what can be done to convince them uh, yeah I think, yeah, I think there's two things. So the first thing is, and this is, this is a difficult, uh, for any, any of you in senior positions, this is quite a difficult question to ask. So often, I think, my experience is, when people get very senior in organisations, very senior managers, the question we need to ask is, did they get there by being evidence-based? Did they get there by being an evidence-based manager? And this is very anecdotal, but my sense is probably not. They got there because they are ambitious. They're probably quite good at politics. They're good at reading people and they're probably quite good at getting stuff done. Mm -hmm. None of those things really are to do with evidence-based practice. So in a way, it's not senior manager's fault. If I'm very senior uh, and I'm maybe being paid quite well and everyone thinks I'm great, I'm going to carry on working the way I've always worked. So we can't blame them as individuals. It's the system through which they've been promoted and given lots of authority, there's actually to blame. So the question was, what can we do about it? And I think that that's difficult because firstly, we don't want to threaten their authority too much. Uh, If you threaten someone's authority who feels that that's the main power they have, is that hierarchical position, it's not going to turn out well. I think if we try and get them on side by again saying, we collectively trying to do a better job we should be trying to do what's important for the organization we should be trying to do what's more likely to work and to actually talk i think to see manager about what's more likely to help them do that not Mm -hmm. not in a threatening way but just to say that obviously they're wonderful and they're marvelous leaders but could we be doing things a little bit better Mm -hmm. and i think now's the point to get them on board with this idea in a way that doesn't threaten their authority and power to you Thank you. There is another question. How does evidence-based approach aid HR professionals to show return in, uh, on investment on HR initiative? initiative? This is Mubarak. Yeah, Barak, that's a really good question. And I think this, this is tricky. So my sense is, I don't know what yours is, mm-hmm. my sense is over the last maybe 20, 30 years, maybe a bit longer, HR has been very worried and very concerned about its professional status. Mm-hmm. The idea of a seat at the table, we must have a seat at the table. You know, people are not taking it seriously. And I think 
as a consequence, I've tried different tactics, including things like uh, HR business partnering, including doing whatever it is senior leaders want, including latching onto one idea and saying, this is so important for the business. Everybody needs to listen to us. I think none of those things work. I think the only way to show you add value is to actually show, show it, show where you do it. And equally importantly is to show where you do not add value. And I think this is one of the key things to any profession. Any profession, I think in the end, gets its status, not by saying, aren't we great? Aren't we wonderful? Everything we do is marvelous. I think, I think a profession we take seriously is one that also says, puts its hand up and says, you know what? That stuff we were doing, that practice, that policy was terrible. It didn't mm. work. Mm. We made a mistake. We're going to do better. And I think in the end, HR should be less obsessed with proving its value mm. and actually just being open about whether what it does is working, how it isn't working, and how it's going to do things differently. Mm. I think that's the key thing for HR professionals, to get away from having a seat at the table, getting away a bit from saying we've got to prove our value. Well, mm. maybe HR doesn't have value in some circumstances. That's okay. That's okay. We do in others, we do in some, we don't in others. And I think we have to get away from that uh, thinking that everything we do has to be marvellous. It doesn't. Mm. Some things we do probably don't have much value. And that, by the way, is true of every single function in an organisation, whether it's marketing or information technology or estates and buildings or finance. Every function does things that maybe don't have value. And that's okay as mm. long as we stand back and think about if we are doing what's important and what's more likely to work. Mm. And as long as we do that, and we all try and do it, then I think that's okay. Thank you. Let, let me just open up to the others. Uh, there's another question. Um, it says, in other words, will evidence-based sure. management help HR in adding value in the organization? Because uh, predominantly, HR has been logged as a not so important. I think Prof has already answered this issue of, of, of sitting on the table. Uh, yeah. I think you have yeah. just answered that question. Uh, sure. you, you, uh, before I yeah. open up uh, maybe for five minutes to, to, for those that may want to talk to you directly, uh, one question that I want to ask is the issue of context. If something works somewhere else perfectly yes. well and everything, does it necessarily transfer to my organization? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, uh, and I think that's a very, very important question. So uh, if I'm going to use a kind of contemporary example. So if you think about the way different countries have responded to COVID-19, for mm -hmm. example, so different countries have done slightly different things at different times and people are trying to compare, well, you know, South Korea did that and it was really effective or China did this and it really worked. Fine. That's fine. Firstly, it doesn't mean you can do it in your context. So there's no point in trying to copy something you can't actually technically do or physically do. There's no, there's no point in looking at that as a model. Secondly, it may be there are things about all kinds of things such as living conditions, the way people travel, the way people work, all those issues that may mean something that would work in a huge city in China mm -hmm. is not going to work in a rural area, say, in the United Kingdom. It's not really going to work. It's, it's pointless trying to follow it. So I think we have to be extremely careful about context. And this goes back to looking at th those issues of our organisational data. Mm -hmm. I think our own experience uh, as practitioners, but also the stakeholders. Mm -hmm something may look very attractive and look like it's going to be effective, but after one conversation with the stakeholder, we may quickly realize it's not going to work in our context. So mm -hmm. I think that context bit is incredibly important. It's something we do, I think in HR and other fields, we often ignore. We just assume that things are going to work. And I think also it's a bit about fads and fashion. So in HR, for example, mm -hmm. there's often examples of, uh, you know, great, supposedly great businesses, like whatever, Facebook or Google or whoever, <laughs> and we look at what they do and go, well, Google are really effective and they do this. Well, you are not Google. So it's probably not going to work. And secondly, Google would make a lot of money, I think, even if it was the most badly managed company in the world. Because the reason it makes money is because it has a way of making money. It's not so much because of the way it's managed. We need to be yeah, very careful about context. And that mm. comes back to being asking good questions about what is the problem, what's the issue. Is it similar to other people? So that's a very important question, yeah. Thank you. There's another very tough question for you, uh, Prof. Yeah. Uh, this is Michael. He says, can we say the HR manager resists evidence based on HR management as a result of incompetence 
for a lack of technical knowledge required to do this uh, to do the job this is michael in nigeria yeah mm. hi michael yeah so i think why so the question is about what is stopping hr professionals from doing this i think mm. i think nothing i mean i think these barriers these pro these barriers to do it are quite difficult so i think firstly yes it's partly the legacy of hr so i guess it's come from historically being quite an administrative function around things maybe like payroll and, and recruitment and I think it's moved more into the street, strategic, strategic area, which is fine. But I think there often is a difference. I think somebody who, say, does payroll or is involved in that kind of activity doesn't need to be evidence-based in the same way as someone who's thinking more strategically. So I think some people argue you need almost more of a split in HR between, between the more administrative parts of that and maybe the more strategic parts of HR, which sort of makes some sense to me. I think that's one issue. I think the second issue potentially is the training of HR professionals. So what qualifications do they need? How are they recruited themselves? How do they themselves progress to become senior leaders in HR? What are they rewarded for doing? So I think, it, again, I, I don't so much blame individual HR practitioners. I would say it's a sort of, you can look at the context in which they've been recruited and promoted and trained to explain some of this. But in principle, my sense is, a lot of the basic skills you need to do to be evidence-based, we already have. So most of us can look at, I don't know, uh, all kinds of information and evidence and start to make a judgment about whether it's reliable or not. We read things online, some of them we trust, some of them we don't trust. We ask questions. And for me, some of this is about taking our already existing skepticism and the way we ask questions and understand the world and applying it in a more systematic way, in this case, to HR. Mm. So I think we already have those skills. So it's a question of starting to try and use them a bit more in our HR work. But I would, I would sort of tend to agree uh, that, in general, I, if I look around the world of HR, I don't see a lot of evidence-based practice. However, I would say HR is probably no better or worse than lots of other areas, lots of other functions within management. So. It may not be doing great, but I don't think, in general, organisations are great at this stuff either. Okay. Then maybe I'll open up for two or three questions, then we, we close the session. Sure. Yeah, if there's anyone who wants to, to, to raise a question, you can just admit yourself, then you can ask your question. Any questions? Prof, you might, must have done a wonderful job. I think, I think there are no questions. Uh, I'll be yeah, ready. I have a, hello. Yes, hello. Right. Yeah, uh, good morning, Rob, and morning. Uh, host. Mm -hmm. um, my question is that uh, oftentimes uh, HR professionals find themselves in an organization dealing with uh, senior management who may in some times may not know the particular uh, role of HR in an organization. Yeah. So thereby bombarding HR professionals with so many expectations that uh, at the long run hinder them to put off initiatives that are evidence-based that would add value to the organization. Yeah. Your comment. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, th I think I, I, I agree. And I think, uh, again, I would say it's difficult, but I think it's up to us as a profession to start, if you like, explaining to organizations what it is we do do. And again, one of my senses is the, uh, again, I'm not sure about your context, but things like the business partnering model, I think one downside that has is it's made HR, how put it, almost like, to treat senior managers as their customers and clients, mm -hmm. which is okay, but actually, as you're implying, maybe senior managers don't always understand what it is HR does. So they end up, as you're saying, asking us as HR people to do stuff. And if we treat senior managers as our customers and clients, then we just tend to want to keep them happy. We want to do what they want. We want to do stuff that we think will, will please them. And that's a mistake. I think that's just fundamentally a mistake. So I think a little bit of pushback it, without annoying people is not a bad thing to do. 
but at the same time explaining what it is HR can do, what it does do, and what, what it doesn't do to some extent. So look, this, these are the kinds of things we do. These are kinds of practices. We deal with performance. We deal with absence. We deal with motivate. These are the things we know something about. These are the things we can focus on. And pushing, I think, senior managers more towards understanding that this is a collective thing that we are looking to help the organization we want the organization to perform better we want individuals to perform better whatever it happens to be we are working together with you on this so can we focus on what the opportunities and issues are mm -hmm. i think it's all trying to change that conversation away from our customer sort of customer client service provider discussion to one about a broader one about what is the organization trying to achieve and one of the challenges is doing this is if as an HR person, you push back a little bit to senior management and say to them, well, what is it you're actually trying to achieve here? The problem is they may not know, or they may not have a very clear idea. So it's hard as an HR practitioner to help the organization achieve its goals if the organization itself is not too clear about that. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a role for HR in trying to help senior management to actually do that, to work collectively to think about what it is the organization is trying to achieve rather than leave that to a group of people who then tell HR what they want them to do. I think that's kind of the wrong way around. Okay, thank you very much, Prof, for, for, for that. Any other question? Maybe while you're waiting for, for the question, Prof, my last question to you is uh, the, the COVID-19, the way you, you talked about yeah. how different countries have handled it. Um, but there was some, I, I listened to some debate uh, online where some people were saying, that uh, countries that are being run by females tend to do uh, yeah. doing better. Yeah. Uh, and also sure. countries that are more well with the right better education system tended to do better. Is that correct? Well, <laughs> that's a very good question, quite a controversial. So what I would say is you may or may, you all may be familiar with the book by uh, Thomas Kamara Premuzic mm -hmm. called Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders? So my feeling about this would be, yes, it does. It certainly does appear, and it's hard to analyze, but it really does appear that women leaders in this COVID-19 context appear to be doing much better. Mm -hmm. Now, one argument, and Thomas would make this as well, mm -hmm. I think, is to say that, yes, they are. They're doing well. They are competent. But actually, it's not necessarily just that they're, and they're not maybe better than men, but it's because the men are particularly not very competent. So it's not so that the women here are doing amazingly. They're just better than really bad, <laughs> fairly incompetent men in this context. That's the kind of argument that we're being made. In other words, the question is not so much why are the women doing better, which is interesting, but the real question is why are so many, does it appear that so many not very competent men are in these positions of very senior power? And I think it's a quite interesting way of reframing that issue around how did we have a political system? Mm -hmm. We can all think of examples that, if you like, allow leaders who are just not that good at leading to be in these positions. And I think I think that's where people. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. What What about the education system? Where you would find, look at countries like Singapore, uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, yeah, uh, New Zealand. Uh, yeah. Some are arguing that they got it better. Their education system is much better, so they did well uh, on COVID nineteen. Yeah, I mean, it could be, it could be the, the, the education system mm -hmm. that idea is a proxy for all kinds of other things, like the training of all kinds of staff, maybe from the you know, police to doctors to nurses to to everybody. So maybe the general level of training is better. It also maybe means the communication to the population about the the issue is a bit better as well. It may be people's ability to react is a little bit better. So. My guess is it, it, it's, yeah, so there may be something in that around, around educational level yeah. in general. Yes, I'm not yeah. too sure, but it makes okay. sense to me. I'll take my last question, Douglas. Do you want to ask the question? My last question, then we close the session. We're over by five minutes. Uh, good morning, uh, Rob and the memory. Hi, Douglas. Good, thank you. My question is, in this environment, um, so many things are happening and we don't seem to be very good at analytics and I yeah. would have thought that uh, HR analytics would actually aid in some of the decisions that apply to the particular company yeah. because with HR analytics you're really looking at data that concerns 
your own organization rather than other organizations as you were saying it's not useful to copy from say amazon yeah or ibm for for your purposes how can we leverage hr and hr analytics to become more evidence-based as okay. Mm-hmm. as organizations or as an HR function? Yeah, thank you. It's a good question. So my sense, and I'm not sure about what, what, what your perception is, but my sense is that HR analytics has become a little bit, I don't know, gee whiz, isn't that amazing? Isn't this cool? Look, we predicted this stuff. And yes, I think that's fine. But actually, I think a lot of very important analytics depend crucially on having good quality data to begin with. So my, my sense is from uh, large organizations that have maybe very big management information systems around HR is they, yes, they collect lots and lots and lots and lots of data, but a lot of it is irrelevant and a lot of it's very low quality. So I think we should start by thinking less about the, anal- the analysis of those data and rather stop thinking about that for a while until we're really sure we are collecting high quality evidence that's relevant to decision makers so in other words it's not just about analyzing data it's about having high quality relevant data to begin with and i think often the data we need to make good decisions may be quite simple uh, and the analysis may be quite simple we may not need some incredibly complex regression model to use data effectively maybe quite simple high quality relevant data is, is enough for many kinds of decisions. So I think it's, it's probably important to take a step back and say, what are we doing in this organization? What is the information we need to make better decisions about how to manage people in this organization? And have we got it? I think if most people ask that question, they say they haven't got it. Mm-hmm. So, right, so again, to repeat, rather think about the analytics, think about what's the information we really need here. And let's make sure we've got it. We've got it when we need it in the format we need it, and in a way that's going to help us make more informed decisions. Yeah. Thank thank you very much, Prof. I think you've done justice to to the questions in the presentation. I hope to call on you again in the future, as I've always done, uh, to take this particular discussion even a step further. Uh, uh, You are going to send me the presentation. We'll create a link on our website. Yes, I am. We can uh, can share. I've also recorded this particular presentation. I'll also share the link. We'll also extensively share the link on social media for the next seven, 10 days. So uh, Prof will also have the same link. Uh, so you can uh, follow me or Prof and get this kind of information. You all get the link to the presentation, the link to the recording as well. All those will be shared uh, in the next few hours. And uh, thank you very much for, for coming, Prof. Uh, enjoy thank the Thank you, you're welcome. Thank you uh, to participate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. If you've got any questions, yeah. please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers.